Not only was I an English literature major, but I was born in a small town in, a little, in, a, in the state of Montana where most of us don't get out for higher education. So um, it, 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 there is a testament to the fact that if you, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and you have a passion for what you do, you can uh, accomplish many things. Uh, one thing I will say is having a cadre of really good collaborators is probably one of the main reasons why I've gotten to where I am today. Uh, choosing your colleagues well and just learning from them has been probably one of the most important career trajectory experiences that I've had. Um, that being said, I, I have been doing this for over 30 years now. Um, and what I wanted to try to accomplish with my prestige lecture here today is encapsulate uh, the journey of learning that has taken place with me for these last 30 years. Some of them have been innovations in a particular technique. Others of them have been maybe more of a melding of philosophy of science and how do we approach uh, knowledge and understanding. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to be presenting is going to be cobbled together from some of the articles that I've written, uh, some of them older, some of them newer. Um, one of the more keynote of them actually was an essay that I had an opportunity to write a few years ago um, here in the center called Methodological Practices, Matters of Justice, Justification and the Pursuit of Verisimilitude. Because over the last 30 years I have realized that the work that we do is a matter of social justice. Um, I did see one of the advertisements about how theories should be honest, but I also think that our methodologies that test those theories need to be as honest and as robust and as up-to-date and cutting-edge as they can be in order to make sure that we are getting at the answers that will support our honest theories. Right? As we want to try to inform policy and practice and we're doing something with t-tests and ANOVAs, we're more than likely going to be missing out because of all the various assumptions that we are ignoring. We need to start thinking about how can we ramp up our methodology not only in terms of the statistical methodology, but all the way back from design and measurement issues. And it's all a big compliment. So when people ask me sometimes, oh, well, are you a statistician? And I would say, no, I'm really a methodologist. And as a methodologist, we have to start thinking about everything from understanding the theory to the point where we can couch it as a testable hypothesis. And then from there, what would be a design that we could utilize? And from there, what would be some of the things that we should think about measurement-wise that would really encapsulate what it is that we're trying to tackle? And then, yes, we do have to deal with the statistical side of things. But even there, it's going to be on the dissemination end. How do we take what we've learned statistically and represent that as something that somebody could take into an actionable research idea? What, you know, how do we convert it into uh, something like a relative risk ratio that people can wrap their heads around so a policymaker could say, oh, this is important. Right. Um, and that being said, um, methods are not applied. One of the things that I learned early on from my training with my graduate advisor, Keith Wittemann, and later through people like John Nesselrode, is that methodology is something that needs to be justified. We have a lot of tools, a lot of principles, a lot of ways that these tools can be put together. And our job as a good methodologist is to determine exactly how the different pieces should be chosen, linked together, and then presented to the data to see can we recover, can we uncover uh, through, basically I call it principle verification, not necessarily discovery. Because more often than not that what we are trying to accomplish, we have a good idea of what it is. And a lot of times our older statistical training has always been, well, you should be divorcing yourself from your hypothesis. We have to have these nil hypotheses. We have to have these a priori kinds of blinders on when everything that we did up until the point that we did the experiment was thoughtful, reasonable. Well, why not then take the next step and approach the analytics from the same kind of thought and reason that generated the whole process to begin with? Um, <clears throat> I mean, essentially, we are pursuing what I refer to as verisimilitude. I do think that there is, in many fields right now, a push toward understanding causality with a capital C. 
And I think when we start thinking about the human condition and start looking at all of the social um, issues that we are trying to understand and disentangle and get at a truth-like value that, under, that underlies them, we're dealing with a massively multivariate world. We're also dealing with a very open system. It's not a system that's sufficiently closed where we can control everything and be able to say causality with a capital C. And I do think that there are a lot of methodologies out there that are extremely useful and just as powerful as our uh, controlled clinical trials that we hold up as being a gold standard, but that doesn't mean we can't have a larger, broader repertoire of techniques to get at that truth-like value that will still inform practice, still inform policy with just as much relevance as that clinical trial, which nine times out of ten becomes so contaminated it becomes a quasi-experimental design anyway. So those are kind of the three pillars that I have predicated my research career around. And one other thing that I have been predicating my research career around is moving away from the traditional academic model of me-search. Me-search is the way that merit and promotion committees often are organized. Me-search is how I describe my research, my lab, my students, my first author publication, my sole author publication. And we need to start thinking about moving away from the me-search model to what I refer to as a we-search model. And there have been calls for interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity. The only way that we're going to be able to accomplish those kinds of calls is to establish teams, true we-search teams. And a true we-search team is not going to be Here's my data, give it to a statistician. The statistician goes off, comes back with a table of p-values and says, here's your answer. And then you ask, well, do you remember what my question was? <laughs> right? No, I mean, as a developmental psychologist, I, I refer to that as at best parallel play. Right? They're not really trying to build a common sandbox. And the only way to do that is from the get-go. The methodologist on the project has to wrap his or her head around the research question. What's the motivation behind it? What is it that we are trying to understand and accomplish? And then my colleague on the other side of the table has to understand where are these modern methods coming from? Why are we thinking about approaching it with this way of doing it instead of the traditional way that my advisor had learned and my advisor's advisor had learned and so on? Right, so we have to start breaking away and innovating and developing our, tech, our, our methodologies as we attack these questions, especially because our research questions have moved beyond the simple and the sovereign. We've moved beyond main effects. We're talking about mechanisms, processes, moderation. We're talking about complex multivariate systems that we're trying to disentangle and represent. And how do we bring that together so that we can answer those questions in such a way that we have verisimilitude. Um, and as many of you know, error is a rather ubiquitous process. In statistics, we often focus on our type 1 versus type 2 error. And yes, those are important errors to consider when we're making inferences. But for the most part, the errors that can, be, that can permeate throughout the research process are much broader. Uh, I had the opportunity to publish this paper not too long ago with uh, Keith Wittemann, Roy Levy, Joe Rogers, and Greg Hancock, where we got together after, cumulatively, I think we have somewhere on the order of about 150 years of experience in this business. And in those years of experience in this business, we started outlining where have we seen and where do we, where do we appreciate where some of those errors might be occurring and what might we do to... Uh, Basically, the whole idea is error management from the conception to dissemination. Um, and again, in that particular paper, one of the primary conclusions that we drew is establishing a strong research team will mitigate the bulk of where these errors can occur or give you the team that can overcome some of the errors that can occur, like when you have the reviewer error, when the reviewers don't understand what it is that you're doing and might be resistant to publishing a paper with new te techniques, well, 
how as we as a research team can develop that uh, letter back to the editor to provide that compelling justification. You know, it's not just on my shoulders. And I think that's the other thing about this going to a research model is none of us can be the master of everything. Right? And if we put the team together with mastery encompassing it and everybody having overlapping skill sets that we can support, chime in, understand, give feedback, and build together, I think that's when we start seeing the unequivocally positive research results coming out. As I mentioned, modern, mod modern modeling is moving into a much more massively multivariate world. <coughs> Some of the traditional ways of thinking about and approaching how we do data analysis and how we test our research questions, we're moving away from that. We're, you know, we have Bayesian ideas, for example, that is kind of a, a camp within the statistical modeling world. Frequentists have actually moved away from a lot of the frequentist ideas, and they're kind of melding into this idea that we have a wealth of particular tools available to us. How can we put them together in a coherent way that allows us to inter interrogate the data that we have collected with this larger model in mind that we can come up with making good decisions. Just like we tell our kids, you know, make good decisions and you're going to grow up all right. Similar thing will happen as we're building models. As we're making good decisions, we're going to come up with an unequivocally better model. One that we can put forward with pride and one that somebody else could review. And when we talk about this process, it's not objectivity, subjectivity, it's transparency and all of the open science movements that we should be embracing. We should be sharing our data. We should be sharing our scripts. We should put everything that we've done in some form of a repository that others can see, maybe learn from, also review, maybe identify errors. As we all know, errors are ubiquitous. All right. So in the process of, of, of modeling data, we are going to be coming up with more complex models, models that almost by definition cannot be 100% a priori. We can start off with really good guesses. We can start off with a model that has lots of features in there that we think are going to be there, but there's going to be a set of parameters in any given model where you just say, well, we're not sure when we put them together which one is actually going to be more important. We might have hypotheses about mediation, for example. We might have multiple mediators. And every single one of them may actually be borne out in an experimental study. But what happens when you pit them all together? Right? Well, now, in the context of multiple mediators, two of those mediators don't have any bearing on it. Right? It's these other mediators that are important, at least given this particular sample that we've collected. And so it's a process of building it up and having a research team to kind of guard against those, the, that tendency to overfit data, that tendency to find findings that, well, I can tell a good story about this one. Right? Well, we, won't, we don't want to tell a good story. We want to tell a story that we think our data support. And if we're working together as a team, we're going to resist that tendency to start telling a story just because that's one I can tell. It's one that we have to be able to share the responsibility for. And that's where the research teams come in. Okay, so as I was saying, not all the innovations that we're going to be talking about are necessarily innovations in the analysis side of things. We've had uh, some movement. I'm going to talk of, about a few innovations in measurement, things that you should be aware of at least. Again, I'm going to be all over the place here with a lot of ideas before I really get to the point of the uh, prestige lecture, which is how can we start bringing some of these innovations together to start doing more effective analysis of evaluations. Um, so, um, again, thinking about measurement, when you do a quick review of most programs, there are just not that many programs out there that are teaching fundamentals of psychometrics. And they're really not teaching what I refer to as omnimetrics, right? So when we start moving beyond the field of psychology into sociology and econometrics and things that we could start thinking, well, how can we bring in all of those ideas for measurement and start cobbling them together and learn from them so that we can develop these nested 
models that look at the sociological impact and economic impact on the psychology, on us as a group, how do we improve our measurement process? Um, and so encouraging you to take what's out there and modify it, adapt it, learn from it and say, well, let me come up with a way of measuring that I think is going to work for the context in which I'm trying to do this particular study. No measure is valid. Only the use to which it is put is valid. And if we're not understanding that and willing to take the moment needed to look at that instrument, what modifications do I need to do to that instrument in order to make it valid for the particular use to which I want it put, we're not going to be able to get at those good answers that we want. Right? Even when we start thinking about Likert scales, 1932 was when Likert came up with this convenient way of collecting information. Back in a time in 1928 when this other method, the ruler method, was shown to be quite effective, quite valid. Well, the ruler method involved putting a line on a piece of paper, labeling both ends, asking the respondent to mark on that line where his or her response would lie. The research assistant would bring that back into the lab, place a ruler on that line and count up the number of tick marks necessary to write down two numbers. Well, in that spreadsheet of two numbers, there was a lot of squaring and there was sums of squaring that was you know, error prone, time consuming. And so when Likert developed this other approach, it simplified. And it wasn't half bad. But it's not necessarily the tool that we want to be using today. Um, so for example, a technique that's been out since the 1980s that I don't know why it's still not being thought of or utilized, but in evaluation research, the retrospective pre-post design has a short, tight, nice little history in the 80s of being a well-validated tool. But I think that what happened is Howard, who was one of the ones who developed it, retired, and there was no student that kind of carried the battalion or the baton of, of that particular uh, approach and technique. So recently, we've rekindled this approach as a way to start thinking about assessing perceptions of change. Right? When we do a pre-post design and we ask people at the beginning of the study, what are your beliefs, what are your attitudes, right? how, do you, how do you think about yourself, and then we go to the end and do, do that exact same instrument again with the exact same instructions, two things are going to happen. Right? There's going to be a lot of recalibration that takes place on the account that you've even just given the instrument once but also you've given an intervention. There's going to be more awareness. There's going to be also at the beginning of the time point is going to be a frame of reference issue. We don't know necessarily what the respondent is thinking of when you ask him or her. Am I thinking about a generalized other? Am I thinking about me at a prior time point? And what happens is you get a mixture of the response frame of reference. But when we go to the end, it's pretty clear you're talking about me and where I was when we started this particular intervention trial. Right? So you get what's called a response shift bias, maybe, or at least I call it a response shift. The retrospective pre-post design was meant to kind of get at that response shift. So at the second time point, if I ask the respondent to say, okay, at the beginning of this particular project, what did you think? How did you feel? What did you believe? Now, at the end of the project, where are you? What do you think? How do you feel? And we take the original responses at the pretest and calibrating against the retrospective version of it, and that's how we start to calibrate the amount of response shift that took place. Can we claim that one of them is truth? No. But what happens with this particular approach is we find that the retrospective prepost is nicely sensitive to change where change should have been measured. And it doesn't give you change where change should not have occurred. So when we have in our study design a group that never really got the intervention because the teachers never implemented it, we shouldn't see any change. And sure enough, retrospectively, no change. But then we have after school programs where it was really well implemented. 
And then we have after school programs where it was well, modestly well implemented. And we have some where, well, at least they tried it, but we have some implementation. Some were longer, some were shorter. And every single one of those particular variables that you would expect to show differences on your whatever outcome you're measuring only shows up when we measure it via the retrospective pre-post design. Doesn't show up through the, it, the intervention the way we would normally be measuring it. Innovations, again, in thinking about how to do the measurement are things that we can try. It doesn't mean we didn't get rid of the original pretest, but just we realized that maybe it's not the gold standard that we thought it was, and we can bring something else to help begin to kind of triangulate, cobble together information that supports our validity arguments. So keep in mind, in methodology and statistics, we never have that smoking gun. All we have is a massive trial by circumstantial evidence. And that's all we're trying to do is get as much circumstantial evidence to bear to say that we think we are on the right track with this answer. Um, <clears throat> here's another design that we've worked with when we're looking at developmental change processes. Where at second and subsequent time points, we'll simply ask participants to report Given the midpoint being no change, are you more interested or less interested in given whatever thing we're, we're, we're trying to measure? At time one, we assess what are your interests? And then your score at time two becomes what your interests were plus how much you said you changed. And at time three, it takes that score and cumulatively adds how much you said you changed. What we're able to start detecting then is patterns of change where you can continue to, to grow or continue to decline, whatever it would be. If we're using Likert scales, for example, and you ask somebody, how happy are you? And they say, oh, I'm a seven on this seven point scale. And then I ask you again at time two, how happy are you? Well, I'm actually at 10, but the scale only goes to seven, so all I can tell you is seven. Right? The only thing I'm gonna be able to detect is when somebody went from a seven down to a six or a five. Same thing happens at the bottom of the scale. If I'm miserable and not happy at time one, and I'm less happy at time two, I can't tell you that because the scale starts at one. All you can see is maybe getting better. And we start fitting things like growth curve models to Likert-like data, and why do you think we always get a, a, a negative correlation between intercept and slope? Likert scale. Um, as Ian said, I'm a big fan of and have been an advocate for parceling procedures. Um, ever since my graduate advisor taught me about them um, in my graduate training days. And, you know, it's nice when you're under the tutelage of, you know, the guru that kind of walks you through, well, here's what you look for. Here's, here's the rationale behind them. Um, and so, you know, I started using parcels. They have saved my bacon in many, many research endeavors. But one of the things that was happening is there was still this group out there that just didn't feel comfortable with this whole idea of item parceling. And they would continue to publish papers saying, oh, this has got a problem. Uh, I don't think this is. And so I would end up being the reviewer for all these papers. And Generally speaking, you would find some flaw or some fault in the reasoning, or they would do a simulation study, conclude that parcels are bad, and you look at their table of results and say, I don't see where they're bad. Every one of your, every one of your results is showing you know, no bias. Why, why, would, why are you still holding on to this uh, preferred conclusion without benefit of data? Right? So in the last few years, I've been publishing a few papers more on parceling and walking people through how to do it. And I will say this, I don't believe there is a controversy on it anymore. We've even, I even got some math people to help me go through the covariance algebra to demonstrate what happens. So if, you are, if you're thinking about parceling, I would recommend yes, do it. Be thoughtful about it. Make choices, again, about which items you're gonna to put together and why, and not just do it randomly. And you'll be in really good position to be able to fit some of the complex models with a little bit more stability in that measurement space. Last big issue that I've been uh, spending quite a bit of time on since the 1990s is modern missing data techniques. I remember when I was at the Max Planck Institute um, and John Graham gave to give a short workshop on modern approaches to missing data. 
Um, and within about 15 to 20 minutes of his presentation, my jaw was on the floor, my head was just swimming with the prospect and the ideas of what modern treatments for missing data not only could remedy in terms of unplanned missing data, but also could give you an advantage in terms of planned missing data designs. This is a real powerful, relatively new innovation that we have available to us in our repertoire that we're not really taking advantage of. One good reason for that is, I mean, these were ideas that were good statistical theory in the 70s and 80s, but it really wasn't until the 90s that we finally had software and computers that could kind of coalesce together to say, okay, well, we have a software program that can actually implement it. We have a computer with enough memory and enough CPU capacity that it can actually get it done within our lifetime, uh, running it through one of the modern treatments for missing data. Um, so I would really encourage all of you to become a student of missing data. Learn what these techniques have to do and how to implement them. They too will give you the most valid inferences that you can generate from data because missing data, like errors, is also ubiquitous. And how we can deal with it effectively is going to be really important here. Okay. All right, so to the theme of today's talk, Challenges to intervention research. I've been doing, again, for many years, evaluating various intervention programs, various, um, um, some of them more complex than others. And I've run into these challenges time and time again. Um, and you know, for the most part, when I would be dealing with an intervention project and somebody would say, okay, hey, we need to write the method section, I would write up a beautiful method section on how we're going to do a multi-level analysis and we've got you know all this nested data structure we're going to we're going to account for it we've done all the power calculations for this big multi-level interrogation of the data and then we start collecting the data and schools drop out and you know the study doesn't kick in when we thought it was going to kick in and so all of a sudden all of these things just the wheels fall off right and now my beautiful multi-level model is going to be intractable. There's going to be no way that I'm going to be able to specify that simple model that I thought we were going to do. Anymore in the United States too, there's this, there's this push toward pre-registration and you have to pre-register the analysis model that you, you're going to uh, implement. And if the wheels fall off like they do and you change your pre-registration, you're going to have a hard time getting that thing published. So what I want to try to do here is kind of walk through some of the problems that happen when the wheels fall off, provide a way to think about even pre-registering your intervention that will give you the most latitude to be able to adjust to and accommodate those warts when they emerge, how can you adjust for them, and still be able to keep the integrity of the original intent of the pre-registration in mind. How am I going to evaluate this intervention. Okay. All right, again, we talked about the nested structures. Um, quite often when we're collecting these data, we have moderating influences that maybe weren't the primary motivation, but by the time we start getting into it, we realize, hey, wait a minute, this, this particular intervention really is being moderated by gender. And, and okay, it was a cohort sequential design. And now, we, okay, we do have cohorts that that, that are involved here that we need to start thinking, well, maybe they're getting, you know, spillover from the previous cohort. And there's all those considerations that you didn't think about when you were pre-registering. Well, now we can actually come up with ways to think about how we can start adjusting for some of those things. Variability in the intervention and survey timing. We all want to try to start the survey at the same time, start the intervention at the same time. Practically, does that happen? Very rarely. So how can we account for those differences in time. Surveys, oftentimes we'll start a survey, we'll ask for maybe lifetime exposure to sexual abuse and now we've got this intervention going through, now we want to know well how much has occurred since the last measurement occasion. Well that time frame will change our mean structures and if we're trying to model changes, well we need to maybe think about how do we covary that information out, how do we establish baseline equivalence when we've randomly assigned individuals to treatment and control. Um, of course, we're going to have lots and lots of missing data, and how do we uh, uh, incorporate missing data? When we have 
multi-level data structures and missing data, that can be a real problem. We have schools dropping out, we have whole units dropping out. How do we effectively adapt a missing data model that's also going to fit with my analytic model? Because one of the key things about the missing data literature is the missing data model has to match the analysis model. Right. Um, so again, what happens when you have level two units that are missing and we don't have a good multi-level imputation model, what do we do then? Right. We oftentimes will deal with low base rate phenomenon. Here if we have teen dating violence. Most of the responses are never, but we could look at suicide ideation. We can look at uh, weapon carrying, bullying, any, uh, a, a lot of the intervention effects that the CDC and NIH are often interested in, they're gonna be low base rates. So we're gonna have low power to detect. We're gonna be, quote unquote, violating a lot of distributional assumptions in the process of trying to model them. So what particular modeling procedures can we bring to bear that might be at least robust to some of those potential violations? We have measurement error. As a student of structural equation modeling, generally speaking, that is the primary motivation behind structural equation modeling is the ability to build a measurement model to correct for measurement error, to establish the content validity of what it is that you've measured. And at the same time in that measurement model, we have all kinds of other really important validity information that is there for me to evaluate rather than swept under the table for me to assume. As most of our other techniques, even multi-level modeling, is assuming that we have measurement invariance, for example. It assumes that we have measured things without error. It doesn't have a measurement model to correct for measurement error. All right, um, and lots and lots of confounders that could possibly be represented. So. Uh, you know, we're going through the lack of a measurement model. There are limits to the covariate controls. So when we think about how do we analyze an outcome with a set of predictors when there's a whole bunch of potential confounds, well, what do we typically do? We take all those confounds and we enter them into our analysis model and we try to extract the variability that is accounted for by them so we can see whether our intervention above and beyond the confounders is showing some demonstrated effect. As I mentioned, as we start looking at these multi-level models getting more and more complex with patterns of missing data, covariate patterns that are gonna be moving beyond three and four covariates, sometimes on the order of 150 to 200 potential covariates that we might be including for various reasons. That's not gonna estimate. That is not going to converge. That's not gonna be possible to take this elegant multi-level model and get it to work. So again, how can we begin to simplify and yet still be as accurate as possible to establish the verisimilitude of the intervention evaluation? Okay. Multi-level SEM has come on the scene of late. It too is trying to deal with the nested data structures from an SEM perspective. What's nice about that is it does bring in the measurement model that we want, but that's only at one level of them the analysis. It's not at both level one and level two. We're still making certain assumptions about invariance at the level one uh, evaluation. So again, we're having to make further assumptions and this is going to have the same problem if we add the covariates, we have patterns of missing data. These models, as elegant as they are, may not be appropriate for a large scale intervention evaluation. So with all these evaluations, what do we need to do? Well, with the extensive missing data, we need to start thinking about some state-of-the-craft imputation approach. Full information, maximum likelihood, a model-based estimator generally is not going to work. So if we start thinking about borrowing from some ideas from a package like MICE using chained equations or maybe in other packages, maybe we can start coming up with an imputation model that will actually converge when we have lots of variables in the presence of other variables with missingness. But then again, if you are working with a package like MICE and you're doing chained equations and you have lots of variables, you'll see that it too will have a very difficult time converging. So can we do something to augment it? Right. One of the things we came up with was a procedure for identifying principal component scores out of your data set to utilize as the variables that MICE 
as an opportunity to select to do your imputation model. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, when we have noisy measurement, again, we need to put our latent variable into some metric that I can turn into a meaningful bit of information that I can give to a policymaker. So, well, here's the relative risk ratio that came out from this analysis. How do I do that? Well, if I've got Likert scales, I'm going to have to do some kind of transformation. And there again, I want to maybe put it into a transform metric that has other kinds of inherent meaning that we could maybe start looking at ratios that have some meaning. Well, then when I estimate those values in my latent variable model, I need to be estimating my model in that metric so that the parameters that I get from the model can say, see, this is the value we get for this group, and here's the value we get from this group, and here's the relative risk ratio. Um, how do we deal with the uh, nuisance effects, and then how do we deal with nuanced hypotheses? All right, so one of the things that Again, I learned about back in graduate school is that you can do covariate adjustments in a simple two-step process. It's a simple regression model. I can take the outcome variable of interest and I can regress it on all the covariates and I can output the unstandardized residual from that regression equation and it will be linearly independent of the covariate information. And now I can take that new score, the residual score, and I can plug that into any analysis model that I would want to plug it into, and it is now covariate adjusted. If I add the intercept from that regression equation back in, I retain mean structures information, so if I want to look at mean changes over time in an intervention, or if I want to look at mean differences between intervention and control at later time points, those mean levels in the, are still kept as part of this covariate adjustment process. Um, we talked about parceling, right? So parceling is going to be one of the things that we're going to do as we collect all this data to, to evaluate an intervention. We're going to put it into a multiply indicated framework, but I am a big advocate of what's referred to as proportion of maximum scoring or palm scoring. Right? So palm scoring involves putting everything onto a zero point, right? So if you've got a Likert scale that go, goes from one to seven, just subtract one from everything. Now it goes from zero to six. Well, now if I divide by 6, it goes from 0 to 1. And now the interpretation of any score that I get between 0 and 1, say 0 0.75, means I'm 75 of the maximum. If I multiply by 100, it's a percent. If I don't multiply by 100, it's a proportion. So those relative proportions have a zero point. We can interpret them as such. And if I get two proportions, I can get a relative risk ratio on those proportions. Effects coding. This is a scaling procedure. When we deal with latent variable modeling, one of the things that we always have to do is we have to establish a scale for the latent variable. Typically, it's the marker variable, variable approach where the first loading is fixed at one. That's the default in most software. Or I might say I'm going to fix the factor variance at one to establish a scale for estimating everything. Well, effects coding is actually a technique that we introduced maybe 10 years ago now, which allows you to put constraints on the loadings and constraints on the intercepts such that the latent variable metric is now in the metric of what you've measured. So if I've palm scored my parcels and I take their average, the latent mean is the average palm score. The variance of that latent construct is the average variance that each of those particular indicators is contributing. It is now my best population estimate of the variance. And I can use those two numbers meaningfully to calculate things like relative risk ratios. I can even do norming for brand new developed instruments using effects coding and getting the mean and variance as estimated from these models without having to do corrections that are mostly that we often hear about in, in measurement development norming. Well, we have to correct for measurement error. Well, no, it's already corrected for. I've already got my correct variance. I don't have to adjust it. It's being estimated. I already have my correct mean. It's being estimated. <clears throat> Factorial invariance is also a critical assumption that we make that whatever psychometric tool I'm using at this age, when I go back in a year later, that tool still works for that next age. 
Right? We can make that assumption or we can test it. And that's what factorial invariance as a procedure built into structural equation modeling gives us. A test of whether or not factorial invariance is supported. And if it is, we can impose it so that we know for sure that we're comparing on the same underlying latent construct over time. So when the construct changes, we know it's the construct that's changing and not something that contaminated my measurement process. Another innovation bringing to bear here, which is important, is rescaling. When we're fitting models under factorial invariance constraints, we're dealing with a variance-covariance matrix. We're looking at unstandardized regression weights as we look at the relationships as they unfold over time. When you want to compare two unstandardized regression weights, they are only comparable if the variances that they're based on are also the same. Now, typically what happens when you start doing any kind of a longitudinal evaluation is the variances change. And so all of the unstandardized regression coefficients that you're estimating begin to change their metric. And so fixing a parameter between time one and time two to be equal to some counterpart between time three and time four to say, are they the same magnitude, is, the, is not a question you can ask of unstandardized parameters that are on a different metric. So in 1984, a guy named David Rinskoff talked about a procedure for estimating the standardized solution. Put that as a parameter in my analysis model, but when it becomes an, a parameter in the analysis model, now I can test it. So he came up with this idea that, that again, brilliant ideas back in the 80s, just like Howard's retrospective pre, pre post, but it just never caught on. Maybe it was a level of complexity, maybe it was just nobody was there to carry the baton and say this is a really good procedure, but in, in 1997 I rediscovered it, reintroduced it to the literature, um, and then you know, anybody that will take a stats camp from us will say, okay, we're going to learn about rescaling constructs and how to utilize them. All right. This is an example of an SEM model with rescaling constructs. Um, but it allows us to estimate everything in a standardized metric. So these are parameters of the model. So when I test and constrain any one of these parameters for equivalence across intervention and control, that's a valid test. Thank you. All right. Again, the, we can do the covariate controls as a regression model where we just save the unstandardized residuals and add the intercept back in. We do that at the indicator level, pull those new residualized indicators into the analysis model for testing. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the traditional way, but when we start looking at the principal discovery or verification, um, what I've been arguing for of late, and I mentioned this at the beginning, is we have a lot of ideas. We have an idea of where the intervention should have emerged, maybe it was at time three, we should be seeing this effect and it should be staying you know, relatively stable, maybe growing if we have a continued uh, uh, implementation plan, but then at some point we might say, well, let's, let's assume that at least it stays stable or maybe backs off, but also when we do school-based studies, we have a lot of diurnal processes, spring to fall to spring to fall to spring to fall, those effects, when we think about a traditional hierarchical linear model, we can't specify them as being linear and that my treatment and control group are only going to differ in magnitude of that linear particular trend. This is going to be a wildly zigzagging, a zigzagging trend that I'm going to be trying to model under the expectation of baseline equivalence at one, maybe two time points before we start seeing a bifurcation in that particular trend. And so principled verification is basically imposing a set of constraints on the evaluation part. So in this case, let's say we're looking at mean level changes over time. We might have six time points, treatment control. We might have males and females. We might have two cohorts. So we're dealing essentially with an eight group model, right? gender by cohort by treatment. And I'm going to take all of the means at each of those six time points and I'm going to say, okay, here's the first structure that I expect, baseline equivalence. Right? 
And for cohort three, it should be at two time points because they didn't really start implementing the intervention until just before the second time point. Should be not enough time for it to kick in. But for cohort four, they're gonna, we should see it by, by time two. So those are expectations that the research team kind of develops. You lay out a plan for what those set of hypotheses and kind of the, when decision points are met, that you also have thought through what decisions could we make? Should, which direction can we go when we reach that tree when we have to make a decision? So allowing, for example, moderation of baseline equivalence by gender. All right, if we see that, then within the females of cohort three, they should be equivalent. Within the males of cohort three, they should be equivalent. So we can establish the critical baseline equivalence allowing for moderation and carry that through uh, through the rest of the analysis model. All right. Um, so here is an example of the kind of pattern we would see for, in this case, was cohort four, standard and comprehensive girls. We could establish baseline equivalence. We saw that there was uh, separation at the next time point. That separation changed, but there was a fall of the seventh grade slide back for everybody. Things change when you go to another grade level. For this, for, for the comprehensive schools, they did have lower scores on this thing and it stayed pretty stable, whereas the standard, for the, you know, the standard girls, they started going up and continued to go up, whereas by the final time point, we had a pretty good separation. And because this is in palm scoring metric, I can calculate the relative risk ratio of that difference as a latent variable estimate. But this particular model only has four parameter estimates in it. And those four parameter estimates capture the unconstrained means. If I just plotted them all out there, those unconstrained means are being explained with these four parameter constraints with no loss of information. The p-value for the difference has to be 0.2 or better in the sense we're not going for a 0.05 level. We're going, we really want these to be similar. But every constrained parameter in this model that's not different, everywhere you see that separation, A, we know it's a significant difference, but then because it's in Palm's metric, we can actually look at the change in the relative risk ratio as the intervention unfolds over time. So you might see a mess like this when you're looking at the unconstrained means, but as you put the constraints, so in this case we have four parameter estimates that describe all of the means that we just saw on the previous slide, but then when we go about plotting them out, we'll start seeing patterns like this, where we can have you know, multiple outcomes, where we start seeing the various kinds of differences, and also we have no differences. Right? So if they're not there, they're not necessarily going to be manufactured when they don't exist. So if you were to put and pre-register a longitudinal, multiple group, fixed effects evaluation for your intervention evaluation, this is what you would be proposing. And in it, you would talk about things like covariate adjustment being done as a two-step process. And you would talk about putting things on a comparable metric using things like palm scoring, dealing with missing data using a modern treatment for missing data, using uh, multiple imputation supported by principal components, and so on. So again, this is kind of all over the place. Um, I would encourage if you want to learn more about how you can put all of these things together as part of your research agenda. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot of these things at the Stats Camp coming up next week. Uh, but you can also, there's a conference that I organize in Whitefish, Montana, called the Developmental Methods, where we talk about some of these things, as well as uh, the other Stats Camps that we offer. And we're also offering them beyond just our regular camps in June. We have them in London in the, in the fall, and we have them in Atlanta in the spring. Thank you very much for indulging me.